Good evening, everybody. This is Professor Mani on behalf of the Bombay Management Association, welcoming you to the 30th edition of our Wednesday Wisdom Webinars. As many of us are aware, we started the concept of Wednesday Wisdom Webinars when lockdown was imminent. And from the month of April onwards till today in October, we are delighted that we could bring in 30 luminaries who could discuss various aspects of human resource management, managing companies, managing self. And today's session is looking at yet another dimension, managing trade and businesses. I'm delighted to have in our midst, the president of Albia and the managing founder of UM Kona and Company, Sri Jayant Lapsia in our midst. Welcome Jayant Bhai. It's indeed a pleasure to have you in our midst. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure too. Introducing Mr. Lapsia is not an easy task. He is whom we call a typical all-rounder. All-rounder often reminds us of cricket. And one of the first passions that Mr. Lapsia has is he's a radio commentator on All India Radio for cricket and basketball. He's also well known for his ability to be organizing several sports events because he himself is an avid basketball champion. President of Indian Gym Kana also finds time for a lot of religious and socio-charitable activities as the president of Sri Hariyara Putra Bhajan Samaj. A multifaceted personality is in touch with industry and commerce, has been often recognized right up to the president of India for his outstanding contribution to the export import business, which he represents as part of the company he founded, UM Kona and Company, which is today 70 years old, started by his forefathers. And he today is carrying the flag very, very high. Mr. Lapsia is part of several trade federation, trade bodies, and as I mentioned, the president of Albia right now. Over to you, Mr. Lapsia. Thank you for honoring our request from BMA and we are looking forward to learn from you the e impact of EXIM post-COVID as the scenario we are in today. Over to you, Mr. Lapsia. Well, thank you and uh, very good evening. Thank you, Professor Mani. And I would like to thank the Bombay Management Association for giving me this opportunity of sharing my views. And I'm, I think, humbled by your words to say that you are going to learn from me because uh, you are all luminaries. I can only share my views. And obviously, the, the response which I get after you hear my views would also enlighten me. But uh, without uh, much ado, we straight away come to the topic of uh, the outlook of Exim trade uh, post pandemic. Now, this pandemic is something which uh, in this millennium, no human being on the planet Earth would have ever witnessed or envisaged a calamity of such a huge magnitude and devastation. The whole dynamics, whether it be business, whether it be lives, whether it be profession, everything has gone for a toss and changed. The whole lifestyles of people, the business styles have changed. And today we find that in India especially, and I'm going to restrict my talk to the trade in India, in India, working from home was a concept which was picking up only since last about a year or so, and that too in a very handful of companies, uh, multinational companies, which had, uh, you know, the branches in India and the headquarters were uh, overseas. But now with this pandemic in full force, and uh, it is still uncertain as to when eventually we'll uh, have a total freedom from this uh, deadly virus, I think we will continue to be dominated and guided by this virus and uh, the lockdown rules imposed by the government which restrict our movements. Now this, fortunately, to a great extent, the pandemic has not impacted the existing trade. The import and export activities uh, continue and the momentum though may have slightly reduced uh, to an extent of say by reduced by about 30%. So 70%, yes, because India's dependence on imports is huge, especially 
on edible oils and the certain chemicals certain uh, automobile parts and certain commodities where india has to import similarly exports also india relies much on exports to sustain its uh, foreign exchange uh, reserves when this pandemic started there was a panic it was virtually like a setting a cat amongst the pigeons and people were skeptical as to how things would move how cargoes would move out of the docks of the ports how would the transport be you know impacted but fortunately things fell in place government did an excellent job we must uh, acknowledge the contributions of uh, the government of india especially our honorable prime minister i mean who really uh, made some uh, took some bold decisions and ensured that uh, certain segments like uh, you know logistics shipping they were kept under the essential services and even these custom officers the port officers and all were directed to report to work and ensure that the exim trade did not suffer but having said that obviously there have been um, pitfalls and there have been hurdles but which have been created by the system rather than the government the intentions of the government has been very good it has been to facilitate the trade and to mitigate the hardships which the trade has been facing but unfortunately what has happened is certain initiatives and measures introduced by the central board of indirect taxes and customs that is cbic has now proved to be counterproductive one is the faceless scheme which they introduced which i personally felt being 40 years in customs business this is the wrong time to introduce any such new scheme and that has created a chaos in the entire trade across the country over all the ports and custom stations and second of course was the introduction of the carota rules that is the certificate of origin which obviously i would support the government because there were a lot of malpractices and uh, people were misusing and abusing the certificate of origin and there was a huge duty evasion so that mandated the government to introduce certain strict rules but then they at implementation levels i mean it has been a nightmare so since last about two months the entire import trade across the country not only in mumbai or jnpt or you can talk about kandla but across the country is facing huge problems in fact we have written to the pmo we have written to the finance minister to have a rethink on uh, withdrawing this faceless uh, scheme it worked well it will work well in uh, in in direct taxes like like income tax because income tax even if it's faceless there is a delay of 4 days 5 days 7 days 10 days i mean it doesn't make a difference but in customs in imports especially liquid bulk and i represent the fraternity of all india liquid bulk importers and exporters association which contributes 62% of the revenue to the customs exchequer by way of duties customs duties now here liquid bulk trade is so sensitive that a days delay will make the importer incur a cost of anywhere between 25000 us dollars to 35000 us dollars as a part of demerge and mind you this is payable in foreign exchange us dollars and we have been sensitizing the government that liquid bulk is a very sensitive and critical commodity so you should not tinker with this and if you come out with any new schemes please first take our views whether this particular scheme will be compatible to the liquid bulk industry because eventually the if the liquid bulk industry suffers the nation also suffers because there is an outflow of foreign exchange and that didn't happen and then today in faceless it is totally mayhem i mean there is such an amount of uh, confusion going on what uh, the documents which were being cleared assessed and the goods cleared on the same day prior to faceless today we are taking the department is taking 6 to 7 days now this is certainly not acceptable so we are knocking at the doors of the government and telling them that you know they should do something to come out now these are part and parcel of uh, our trade with the departments where they come out but to tell people that the post pandemic uh, what should we expect <clears throat> that is of most importance post pandemic things are going to change the entire operationals of uh, various uh, 
you know factories offices shops establishments everything will undergo a sea of change working from home has become a norm will become a norm and i am only a little apprehensive about uh, we as uh, indians how we are going to cope up with the concept of working from home because we are used to a culture of uh, you know sort of universal brotherhood working in an office in an environment we have a lot of people you meet people you have meetings your morning analysis you have evening meetings you assessments you do assessments i mean there is so much of human interaction but working from home for indians is going to be difficult but now you have no choice at least for another 3 4 months you will have to work from home and slowly maybe you will get used to it but the fact remains that i have spoken to many of my friends who are in mncs and who are holding big positions they say i mean initially 21 days uh, you know when uh, the lockdown was announced on 23rd of uh, may 2020 people took it as a vacation and it was some sort of a very exciting lockdown like everybody tried their hands on cooking cleaning washing working from home it was like a picnic but slowly after that when the lockdown kept extending after extending months after months then the reality sunk into people that they are heading for disaster now how long will you continue working from home without going to office without seeing your colleagues without even interacting with them whether they are compatible to the system of working online now the another aspect is that taking advantage of the pandemic as typical indians would do and where i have my own reservations and very very candid thoughts is people will start to be very very selfish and greedy and will go for huge cost cutting measure, measures which will not be required let me tell you and repeat will be not will not be required because in india there is a huge difference between cost cutting and cost saving now cost saving means the onus lies on you to save cost in your environment and not impose it on the vendors or others and make profits at the cost of others now that is what happens in india where most of the companies including big mncs result to cost cutting and the cost cutting is you are cutting the legs of your vendors mind you the impact on the vendors is much more than mncs and big companies who can actually sustain some amount of reduction in business or some amount of losses but vendors cannot sustain imagine you are cutting the legs of a transporter or a custom broker or any logistics provider who has been giving his life either actually in this pandemic in the exim trade the custom brokers the uh, cfs operators the shipping agents the transporters all have been like soldiers they have been on the field with the virus just i mean spreading like wildfire in the initial two months in the months of march and april but our people were there everywhere in uh, port in customs in cfss clearing goods and then now you talk about cost cutting and who is the main actually who can, we can say the brain behind this cost cost cutting measures in india in the companies is the audit department and i would like to ask the chief of the audit department come on let us start with you would you mind uh, taking a reduction of 25% cut in your salary certainly not then why do you do this why don't you do cost saving instead of cost cutting and this is going to have detrimental impact on the entire working and dynamics of the operations of exim trade mind you cost cutting vitiates the atmosphere and encourages malpractices this has been proven and i have al- always told many of the companies that please don't resort to cost cutting as far as certain critical segments are concerned because see eventually nobody is doing social service lunches don't come free if you are going to cut costs of the transporter he is going to make ends meet somewhere you will get shortages or he will start engaging the i mean but deploying some uh, very cheap uh, subcontracted trucks and drivers your material is at stake everything at stake your material may not reach your factories in proper shape there may be pilferages in liquid bulk there can be adulteration so for the sake of few rupees just because your audit department says that no you have to reduce rates 
in this pandemic on the contrary i would appreciate there was one company um, bajaj they have announced that they are going to increase the salaries of the employees in this pandemic and that is the spirit we are indians spiritually also indians being a indian we know that we have a lot of compassion for our human beings now these are this financial consultants who have now suddenly sprung up these auditors whose only aim is to cut people you know uh, chop off their legs mercilessly and make money now this is going to be the norm of the day for at least another 2 3 years but then what they don't realize is that we have seen in the past how it vitiates the atmosphere now this pandemic we should learn lessons to be more patient more resilient and more compassionate towards our fellow beings towards our vendors and work as a team there should be an holistic uh, approach to the entire operations or future operations you cannot just think about making profits and take pandemic as an excuse and tell your vendors are it's pandemic we have suffered losses so we are going to now deduct i mean you have to uh, reduce your rates i mean what about him i mean he also has businesses he also has overheads he also has suffered huge losses so why do you do instead why don't you go for cost saving in our company what we have decided is that we will go for cost saving we are not uh, removing any people nor are we reducing the rates of our vendors because i personally don't believe in doing that when i am advocating that yes so our business heads and the mnc should realize the significant difference between cost saving and cost cutting and for the time being just introspect 30 years back india was a leading i mean as far as business is concerned you had tatas you had godrej you had hindustan levers you had big big names in businesses none of these companies ever had any financial consultants or any big auditors who used to interfere in the internal aspects of the company it is only since the last 25 or maybe 20 years you have found suddenly the influxes of uh, kinds of financial consultant companies is getting into the you know big fmcgs and mncs and then telling them how to structure their finance i mean which is ridiculous because companies huge companies if you can't manage your own finance and you need a financial financial consultant to tell you how to manage your business then i, I think that you are not fit to do business because they charge you ft fees and by going by my 38 years of experience in the line when i spoke to one of the financial consultant i said you know what you are doing you are taking the company to doom i mean it's just taking the company down to the depths of despair so but then that is it and the company paying hefty fees to the financial consultant to serve now this has to stop in post pandemic the financial consultants will find themselves standard because i am not sure nobody would uh, now they will realize that their follies of having appointed them some years back to structure their finances because i strongly believe and feel if companies like godrej hindustan lever or marico or big companies i mean they have done it over years and even small other companies medium size mid size companies have succeeded anyone can succeed you don't need anybody to i mean tell you how to run your finances so this is it and post pandemic also jobs of course will be very 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 at a premium and will become a rare commodity because we have seen and um, even the supreme court has come out with a clear cut guidelines that yes companies have liberty to not pay salaries during the lockdown and also to maybe lay off people and uh, some may be justified yes because if you are not able to earn and not do business and if your factories are shut for 7 months and when you open the factories you see only cobwebs and uh, everything excepting everything is in a mess so you can't be doing anything you have to reduce your staff in that case jobs will be at a big 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 stake and then what do you do so then that will again give you give an opportunity to individuals who are jobless to be more enterprising now remember always in calamity there is an opportunity 
don't get disheartened that this pandemic yes initially knee jerk react reactions can be there but you can be more innovative i have seen people even now though i have been preparing themselves that this lockdown may continue who knows how long but then the fact is that you can be innovative you you have a positive attitude positive mindset and if you are not uh, hassled by the fact that you have lost your job you can still do something on your own you can really make a big impact in your field now that is going to be that is going to happen whether you like it or not you have to face it and very soon once the pandemic settles down trust me with the type of dynamism we have in our prime minister who is pushing this atmanirbhar scheme and the measure and the initiative throughout the country and who has been advocating so much of make in india has been advocating he is doing business now unfortunately yes there have been certain loopholes certain vested interest people are trying to see that these schemes and initiatives do not succeed but i am confident the success of these schemes have already started showing signs and within a year or two these schemes will be a hit so this is where the individuals who find themselves stranded losing out on the jobs can create a significant impact by contributing maybe individually so opportunities galore will be there for people to you know relive their lives and reinvent and rediscover their lives if you have lost job somewhere there's a saying in our bhagavad gita that if lord krishna closes one door he opens 10 doors for you so there's nothing to worry oh yes this pandemic unfortunately has crippled the lives of many people the lifestyles the financial economics everything have gone for a toss but this is part of life you are not the only sufferer the whole world is suffering the planet earth is suffering so at least take uh, solace and consolation in the fact that the whole world is suffering and in this suffering you can see some optimism be optimistic be positive and come back bouncing you will really, really bounce back there will be such nasty auditors and financial consultants who will definitely in every where i mean you see this happening that you know try to pull somebody else's leg and make money at the cost now that attitude should change and as you introduced me being closely associated with spiritual organization and in our office also in our in my organization we infuse a lot of spirituality and spiritual values because uh, as per hindu tradition if you go even 1000 years back when the dharma the laws were laid down for businessmen it very clearly said that you have to respect your fellow human beings and your partners and vendors and everyone so you can't be making at the cost of somebody else so this should be born in mind born in our mind especially the businessmen the ceos and mncs of big companies and be positive have respect for every human being i would say during the pandemic let us not be so greedy that you know we just chase our chase money and see that okay i accumulate my money and then i don't care what the others do this won't sustain the law laws of nature are very clear pandemic has proved that the laws of nature will get back to you so we have to be more considerate this pandemic has taught a lesson how to be more conservative in our spending what we have been spending so lavishly yes you have to cut down i mean somewhere you have to compromise the excessive spending splurging of money on luxury travels going to exotic restaurants every day blowing huge monies all these things at least you will have to stop for 2 3 years till the systems come back on real and your finances also come back on real because now this is an eye opener because you don't know after this pandemic what next so you have to be mentally prepared obviously we are not being so pessimistic and giving you some horrific predictions or uh, nostradamus prediction that uh, maybe something else may come but this is an eye opener that is yes, you this is a lesson for us that we have to live with simplicity and not complexity the more simplicity you live and live within your means i think you will be able to tide over this pandemic with a great ease great contentment and without any fear and apprehensions of being financially insecure now the actual fear when i speak to people is that the insecurity financial insecurity is so overwhelming in people that they feel that uh, post pandemic what will happen to their financial reserves nothing will happen 
this is the time when you have to be prudent in your spending you have to be much more matured in your spending and also savings but at the same time live your life as you have been living let the pandemic not impact you and not make you bogged down to such an extent that you become a mental wreck live with confidence live with positivity and i think you will so to great heights yes there are going to be changes and see change is a way of life from the inception you can say since the uh, charles darwin theory of evolution of man change has been inevitable but the change of this nature due to pandemic had never been envisaged and could have never been expected i mean one could never expect people to adapt to the radical changes which the pandemic actually will bring in but nonetheless since we have been used to changes for last so many years you take from the time of mogul innovations then the british then we had the independence and the 70 years down the line 1992 the liberation the whole opening up of uh, you know the liberalization policies opening up of imports and exports there have been changes there there have been ups and downs no doubt this pandemic has been too severe but nonetheless we have that wherewithal and we have the capacity to withstand and let me tell you with pride that we indians are the most resilient and we have tremendous capacity to withstand this pandemic or any pandemic of any magnitude compared to anyone in the world that is because our roots our roots of uh, being in this very holy land where if you see i am not advocating any religious or attributing any religious uh, sentiments or feelings towards it but it's a fact of life that indians by and large are very very silent and the very fact that the impact of corona virus also in india has been to some extent the intensity of impact has been less far less it's been up to the research shows only up to 60 65% compared to other countries so i mean we are on a more safer planet i would say and we should try and be positive take much uh, positivity from this particular pandemic rather than take you know thinking negative as to what will happen what will not happen how will you survive what will how will you do this how will you instead of going into the negative trait and negative mindset as to all the knows and all what not happens we should start thinking as the on the positive side as to what best you will be able to do how we will be able to capitalize on certain things how you will be able to give value addition or value addition is one thing which will be a key to all your efforts and your sustenance in your jobs sustenance in your business now value addition will play a very significant role because what people will need is it has been a routine a monotonous sort of business you have been doing so yes well the people are obviously going to tell you there is nothing new but value addition will certainly give you that edge and will make you more confident of facing much more competition competitions will be there and competitions will be cutthroat much cutthroat than what they were because everybody survival of the fittest everybody would want to survive everybody and everybody has a right to survive and survival of the fittest is going to be the norm where the one who's given who is going to give value addition to his services or to whatever business is doing will certainly have a clean edge over others so i mean it's it's a i think this pandemic no doubt uh, we have been bogged down for nearly 8 months it has been frustrating undoubtedly and even going to work coming to offices we have been skeptical because we never know from where the virus and from whom who is the carrier who would contract it nonetheless having guts and gumption we have been coming to work we have been going back home and thanking god in the night that you know thanking him for having protected us and next day morning when we set out to our homes again we pray to lord almighty that okay to ensure that he protects us and that we don't contract this virus so so far the going has been good but the fact is that the pandemic is still around virus is still hovering around but nonetheless we have to live with it i mean whether you like it or not you can't be confined to your house for 8 months or 9 months doing nothing and then be optimistic and say that, that no god wants you to come out and obviously you have to maintain protocols you have to maintain 
certain norms uh, set out restrictions which have been imposed by the government wearing of mask maintaining social distance not going in crowded places try and avoid eating outside because if you eat outside food i was shocked people ordering food from outside and eating at home because one of my doctor friends told me this is a catastrophe what people are doing because should you contract any illness due to food poisoning or anything else there are no gps there are no doctors so this eventually these are all things which eventually will impact your performance and your output when the time comes to get into your business mode or get into your jobs and trust me going by the way things are moving and everyone is hopeful at least our prime minister is hopeful by end of november first week of december vaccines should be rolling out and even if not last one week we have seen a significant decline in the cases in mumbai i mean from four digits it has come down to three digits good news is that hospital beds are available hospitals are now openly advertising or canvassing the beds are available now with this scenario of course this is all like a pendulum you never know when things open up it can again there can be a second wave but all said and done the pandemic if you are talking about it nothing to worry it's not going to have any major impact on your businesses as far as the future is concerned in fact the future is going to be much more bright because uh, the predictions as far as exim trade is concerned for import and export activity india's dependence on imports for the next 20 years is going to be there it may come down marginally thanks to prime ministers atmanirbhar call and boycott of the chinese goods which has had a tremendous impact but exports will gain ascendancy in the coming months and years so there will be a great thrust on exports because even many of the countries have stopped exporting to china and also stopped importing from china so india has got a market so those who are out of import business or those who are actually jobless can think of getting into the logistics sector of exports getting into freights getting into export shipping getting into exports logistics warehousing there are lot of avenues open i mean nothing to worry because the one thing this government has ensured that whatever be the post pandemic of course now we have termed it as post pandemic despite knowing not knowing when it will end but the fact is that post pandemic also there have been many schemes which have been kept um, up the sleeves of uh, the government which they don't want to roll it out all in one which i think makes sense because there is no use of rolling out all the schemes at uh, one go and then finding that the things are in a mess but uh, surely the times are good and uh, even in pandemic if somebody feels that this man is saying that the times are good that means you should know that uh, pandemic is one thing you have to live with and it's uh, beyond the human control it's beyond control of everyone on this planet earth so you live with it but having to live with it what is it that you want to do is you want to see that how do you live with it despite having the virus you know by your side how do you make business on that's the hallmark of an indian and i am sure we indians are much more dynamic much more vibrant much more dynamic to work with the virus hand in hand and progress and take india to the heights of glory and trust me the predictions of uh, various fi- financial um, you know analysts in uh, europe and also in us i predicted india's growth gdp growth in 2021 and 2022 to be very robust and, uh, and their research has been based on scientific and of course the uh, philosophical not philosophical uh, psychological find uh, readings on the mindset of indian industries and uh, indian people so with that i think i have consumed my 30 minutes and uh, leave it to you for question answers if people have any question questions because uh, within this uh, 30 minutes i've tried to you know encapsulate uh, whatever i mean feelings i had about uh, pandemic mixing it with certain religion and uh, various other things but religion not per uh, you know hindu dharma or any dharma but just to say that based on our indian uh, traditions over to professor mani thank you jayant bhai it was uh, wonderful to hear very various perspectives the trade perspective 
how to manage self and how to manage the organization in a human manner and of course the optimism that you shared with us about the way ahead was indeed a wonderful thing to hear from you i have a lot of questions which i will uh, share with you and request your response you did mention about the fact that the prime minister's program on atmanirbhar bharat is something very motivating and encouraging for the whole nation would you throw some light as to how it would impact import export and would there be certain industry segments which might be more impacted positively or negatively some of your experiences sir yes i mean that is a very very profound question atmanirbhar doesn't mean that you have been totally dependent and you are going to do away with import export certainly not as i said there are many segments where or many components many raw materials which india has to be dependent on and those imports will continue but these raw materials and components which are being imported will be used for manufacturing in the goods indian goods now what has been happening is like you know we used to import certain raw materials and then import other things and assemble them and then flood the markets uh, sell it in the markets but now only one or two components will be imported which are essential which are not available in india but 60 to 70% of the components will be for indian so they will be merged and then the indian industry will continue so it's going it's not going to impact the import and export trade to that extent yes there will be some segment some uh, segments and some industries which will certainly be impacted and imports will stop like for example edible oils palm oil government has put a heavy duty from zero it has suddenly escalated to 50% that that is um, absolutely i mean making uh, imports unviable because then government realized after studies that uh, you can produce a lot of this each state can produce like maharashtra can produce amma gujarat can produce groundnut you can have groundnut oil you can have grape seed oil you can have so many oils in india itself so why do you need imports i mean why do you need imports of palm oil so then they are now encouraging setting up of refineries edible oil refineries throughout the country so with huge capacities so obviously there the dependence on edible oil is slowly going to be eased out it's already on its way out now likewise there are other industries where the impact of import may not be there those industries will have to close down but then they will have to make a switch over you'll have to make a switch now instead of depending on import imported goods find an alternate in india itself some alternative and start manufacturing which is i mean initially it may be difficult but then you have to do it that's the call of the day and you have other no other choice because the uh, government is very clean that our foreign exchange reserves it wants to strengthen to that extent that in the next 10 years i mean our honorable prime ministers uh, vision is that we should be at least in the top 2 or top 3 of the nations and i am sure he will achieve it if this atmanirbhar gets successful and it is going to get successful great we also read a lot about uh, private ports which are coming up in india in a big way and i am sure they are going to impact business uh, in a more constructive manner could you throw some light based on your experiences as to what we can expect in time ahead private ports are coming up yes but unfortunately not in an organized manner what we see is uh, there have been many ports which have uh, come up recently but uh, they have just started now here again you know the intention once your intention is only to make money and you don't have a foresight now many ports are languishing having started now of course i wouldn't like to name the ports because it's not ethical but the fact is that before you start an operation of a port you must have the infrastructure in place you must have the roads in place you must have the warehouses you must have a lot of other amenities and facilities connected to port activities in place you must have a custom station you must have a custom officer posted i mean some of the ports have come up with, without any of these things they have a port and they have declared and then suddenly today there is there are at least three to four ports which are languishing now suddenly they realize that uh, the entry and exit to the port the roads to the port are in so bad shape that uh, nobody would dare go there 
So having started a boat doesn't make sense. But yes, now they have realized the follies, and uh, it will take another three, four years when they will start laying the roads and creating the infrastructure. And then, yes, you may have more ports, more opportunities for uh, people to shift their cargo. And one thing here, where I would say the Ministry of Shipping has miserably failed, is uh, not controlling the tariffs of the ports. I mean, I am quite surprised. I was also on the board of uh, Mumbai Port Trust as a trustee, and I used to always tell the chairman that it's unfair to keep on increasing the tariffs without business. Now, to attract business, any common sense, any businessman would be more competitive. You take case of Rotterdam, the city, or you take case in European countries where the cities are running and functioning on port revenues. the port revenues are actually subsidizing the living of cities why can't we emulate them but here unfortunately politically driven motives are there which prevent these things to happen now bombay mumbai was one of the prima donna number one ports in the world today we don't even we are nowhere on the map i mean so sad we could have done that jnpt today is one of the hubs why don't you capitalize reduce your tariffs encourage more business and with the profits you have what do you do with the profits mumbai had a reserve i mean as a trustee i knew we had a reserve of 6000 crores but what did you do it was languishing in the banks for so many and it is still languishing why why don't you put it to infrastructural use of the city i mean we don't do it so now with this private ports coming in it will give a big big competition to these ports and i'm sure then the government will realize to bring down the tariff so private ports emergence is a boom great would you also like to share your views on the impact of exim vis a vis agriculture in the light of atmanirbhar bharat which you had spoken about uh, just the first one was exim you said uh, export import how uh, does it impact vis a vis agriculture considering all the new it will not impact agriculture at all agriculture is one of the significant activities of our nation right from good old days and uh, we know that lal bahadur honorable lal bahadur shastri ji had even coined that jai jawan jai kisan so agricultural yes to some extent we are self sufficient i mean we have the wherewithals we have got lot of produce no doubt in between again see in the last about 60 years post in independence lot of these exim activities have been politically driven politically motivated so whether there was a need to import say wheat or export this was it's a matter of uh, a big question mark but there were a lot of political things involved in these decisions but per se indian agriculture is the best and is sustainable on a sustainable level so the exim activity i mean whether it gets impacted or not agriculture will not yes the only factor which can impact an agricultural activity in india is the rains monsoon which is not in our hands which is not in hands of anyone excepting the god if the rains are good indian agriculture is the best and that is one of the reasons in last about 3 to 4 years thanks to good monsoon we have had good crops now thanks to good crops india has stopped import of pulses has reduced imports of edible oils because of good crops there have been lot of reductions in imports of agricultural products so that's a good sign healthy sign just pray that you have good monsoon every year and i'm sure we are on a safer harbor since we were talking about ports and private ports and you also rightly mentioned this about connectivity Uh, what do you visualize with nhai the national highway authority of india taking a lot of interest in the last couple of uh, years what would be the impact uh, would that help trade it would certainly help trade but unfortunately in india there is no holistic approach now national highway authority of india is now of course it's a very very good scheme they are now connecting and concentrating on expanding and diversifying the golden corridors and maybe the main lands but if they also connect to the surface transport ministry and the shipping ministry get together and then they decide that yes you should have some arms of the 
you know national highway going towards the port and the connectivity from the port to the highways then it can it will have a lot of sense and lot of meaning and it can really boost the importance of the trade and the trade act i mean the port and the port activities but unfortunately in india we have seen that there is no holistic approach in fact i have been advocating to the finance ministry that you must have only one single ministry for exempt trade which should comprise of finance commerce shipping and surface transport i have a separate ministry for exempt trade because then it becomes very easy policy decisions become easier to be implemented and then you know the segments of imports liquid bulk is a different segment project imports is a different segment containerized cargo is a different segment big bulk is a different segment now all these segments need to be treated with kids gloves you cannot treat all of them with one single policy now that is detrimental and suicidal and that is what is happening so holistic approach is the need of the hour and if you have this holistic approach and understanding between the surface transport ministry and the sh shipping ministry this will be a great great uh, i think kick start to the booming of ports in india uh, all right great uh, we have with us mr fernandes ernest fernandes has been uh, a very senior person with the tata group and has had uh, several positions in the past uh, including in the consumer durables Uh, Mr. Fernandez, over to you for your point and question. Yeah, well, there are many fascinating points we've just heard. I was only wondering this ease of doing business, like uh, countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh have shown great increase in exports and trade. Can't we study their procedures as to how they have been operating in their countries? Why do our procedures have to be so cumbersome? that's a very good point and this point uh, we have been beating and hammering for at least the last 10 years unfortunately india is still following the antiquated british laws if you see certain sections of customs or even the police act talks about 1816 1818 1821 we still follow the british rules and british laws which were actually designed to favor the british no i am surprised that why government is not changing that even the ease of doing business you rightly said many countries have taken it in the right spirit because there are the volumes are low the countries the size of the country is small here in india unfortunately what is happening is when it comes to ease of business there is a lot of insecurity amongst the bureaucrats and the people down the line let me be candid and tell you very honestly that they feel that they will lose their importance and they may lose the additional perks and the fringe benefits which they have been enjoying for the last 70 years so suddenly when you say ease of doing business and uh, you know with all these new initiatives being rolled out by the government to weed out corruption to bring in lot of transparency is met with resistance from within so this will take time in india it's not going to be easy for a man who has been i mean a system for 70 years i mean 70 years post independence but prior to that under the british we had been subjected to a corruption to the magnitude unimaginable magnitude now suddenly you know our honorable prime minister is doing his level best to see that it's uh, weeded out but i'm afraid that will take a lot of time because we are seeing the ground realities how it is being scuttled at the ground level by the officers because that insecurity has been set in because they feel that all these things which they they were enjoying for past so many years will now go away so that is one of the reasons we are behind and smaller countries are coming out ease of doing business was a great great mantra but unfortunately it never took off and it will take time in india to take off yeah actually we were promised by the prime minister uh, maximum governance minimum government but we don't see that happening how is that with such a dynamic prime minister exactly i mean you are hitting the nail on the head the same questions we have been asking that why you say that uh, there will be no interference of the government there will be no interference from any of the but unfortunately the schemes are announced the intentions are made clear but when it comes to the implementation level that is where the bureaucracy sets in to ensure that their cake and their you know safety measures are well taken care of and they are not impacted by this now this unfortunately i don't know whether it has reached the ears of the honorable prime minister at least i am doing my best as an association president going to write to the pmo 
that this is what is the ground reality and uh, pmo should do something because none of the schemes as you rightly said even though the intentions are there but when it comes to implementation at the ground level it is being jeopardized and there have been vested interest officers who will see ensure that these schemes do not take off and the trade and industry get so fed up that they go back to the government and plead that please withdraw it but i'm sure this is not going our prime minister is not going to do that but what will happen is he will now realize that the schemes are being scuttled within his own department and not by the external factors that is the internal factors which are responsible so that is one of the ways where we are languishing uh, mr shankar has a question over to you mr shankar please go ahead yeah hello uh, see uh, you mentioned about the imported palm oil the other side of that is the palm oil causes a high amount of cholesterol and it is used in all the snacks which are being used all over the country and even young people old people they are all consuming it they don't know that they are using palm oil for doing this so the government uh, for the sake of the health of the people should ban palm oil and promote the use of other oils which you mentioned like groundnut oil etc so instead of uh, uh, the import uh, angle to this we should try to you know promote this health and safety angle and ban palm oil what is your view absolutely true that is one of the reasons after uh, see one thing which uh, we are convinced in the trade is that whatever decisions honorable prime minister is taking is after due diligence after 3 4 months of sustained studies on particular subject then it comes out with a decision it's not a random decision overnight that he decides and you have rightly said that palm oil is detrimental to health now it's very common sense if you are staying in maharashtra gujarat you have to eat only ground nut you can't be eating coconut oil and rapeseed oil it will not suit your system if you are staying in kerala you can't eat ground nut and rapeseed because it will not you have to eat coconut oil even though it contains 5% free fatty acid you stay in north uh, east time in calcutta you have to eat rapeseed oil so likewise palm oil was most unsuited for india now fortunately for the uh, i mean government of india when they did the analytical studies they found out that palm oil is really hazardous and to ca- cap with it the import bills the imports of palm oil through malaysia was so high and the local oils were languishing then government decided to discourage the imports now you can't ban because of certain wto agreements you have with uh, you know the foreign countries under the world trade organizations you have certain agreements whereby you can't ban imports so to deter the imports what government did was impose 50% duty now at 50% nobody can import palm oil it is not sustainable i mean nobody can afford it so what happens is automatically people will then resort to your local oils because if you impose 50% uh, duty on palm oil what normally you would have got palm oil for say 50 rupees a kilo now with 50% duty it will be 100 rupees whereas your local oils are at 40 rupees so who will go for palm oil so it's a point well taken that palm oil yes is not was not suitable but because it was cheap and duty was zero and they were flooding the markets and they were cheaper than the local oils people started using palm oil and started using in the cooking which was detrimental to the health better late than never today we have realized its impact so now we are back to our own uh, oils thank you i think we still notice uh, as uh, correctly mentioned by shankar still a lot of the processed food that one finds in the market has a visible component of palm oil so i guess it calls for a certain amount of uh, very very cautious and conscious thinking on avoiding using all this which i'm sure will happen over a period of time but point well noted uh, mr lapse there is one more question is you mentioned about ease of doing business would you make an observation based on your lengthy experience in this uh, entire export import business has it become easier to export and import in terms of ports the norms the customs the rules and regulations how have things changed over the last decade until the pandemic things were better import export activities were better but pandemic suddenly had brought in a lot of changes and as i said the intentions of the government were absolutely good 
to facilitate the trade but then somewhere down the line it backfired and backfired so miserably that in last two months to import and export has become a nuisance and headache of sorts and the whole mindset and attitude of officers have changed i mean nobody wants to take a decision everyone wants to be sort of you know be very protective of himself and doesn't want to come forth so it's been uh, last 2 3 months have been really a nightmare for many of the importers and exporters the costs have gone up the logistics costs have gone up now unless the government you know steps in either the finance minister i mean we know nirmal mrs uh, nirmala sitaraman is a taskmaster unless she addresses his officers and tells them and holds them accountable i don't think uh, things will change because uh, the attitude of officers is negative i mean they i am quite surprised that they don't realize that uh, so much of cargo is lying either un not been able to export or cargo lying not being able to clear i mean why this was never the case in the past in the past it was a different story now in this pandemic it should have been reversed they should have given more thrust to ensure that there is expeditious you know evacuation of import cargo and faster inward entries to the export cargo but unfortunately it is the reverse so the last 2 3 months have been really bad okay i'd uh, now like to invite uh, indrapal singh ji the uh, former president of dma like mr fernandes and uh, uh, doyen from godrej has almost spent about more than four decades with them yeah, he has an observation and a question go ahead indrapal ji yeah no uh, my, my observation was that uh, with atmanirbhar bharat coming in there would be a spurt in manufacturing activity uh, undoubtedly so uh, we have to make our ecosystem of exporting uh, very very uh, very simple and very effective so that we can take care, take advantage of the opportunities that surround us for example entire africa we can dominate gulf countries we can dominate with our exports and even so many other countries in southeast asia we can compete very very well but for that the ease of uh, doing business which i suppose today uh, it, it is on the 0 to 10 difficulty we could be close to 8 that has to be brought down to 3 or 4 so that we can compete with the tigers of east asia like korea and others and taiwan and, and we can have brighter future for all because to depend on the growth of the country only on the local market is not going to be feasible if you want uh, manufacturing which is scaled up my my experience with the manufacturing industry so i'm i am uh, bringing that into the context so any views on that uh, mr napsia no you are absolutely right i mean uh, we should focus on uh, our exports to various uh, countries and uh, the countries which you mentioned are the right potential but uh, heartening <coughs> news is that the way i mean the impact created by um, the indian companies in exports today besides the countries you have mentioned which are really a good potential for export markets there are other european countries also which are looking up to india for their goods and if atmanirbhar succeeds and should succeed over a period of time once the government weeds out all the you know problems at the ground grassroots levels then obviously exports is going to take a boom and many of these countries like you rightly said africa vietnam so many other small countries will look up to india and today if you see your cars um, export of your cars export yeah. is going to so many countries and there are so many specialized products in india which the european markets are eyeing for and now with china being slowly being distanced by many of the countries you know who are avoiding china india has got a huge huge potential to capitalize on uh, this particular as aspect of uh, chinese boycott by many countries and start exporting and uh, this is where the atmanirbhar and i think uh, that is a master stroke by our honorable prime minister of getting in atmanirbhar at a time when he put plugs on china and he knew china was the world's largest exporter and largest importer now you put plug there means so automatically people are going to come to india and we have already seen signs of many of the foreign companies starting to show interest and in also coming into india in uttar pradesh you have seen many of the foreign companies already talking to the honorable chief minister yogi nath 
to set up factories and they have already been allotted land likewise there are other states also where uh, these companies want to set in big big companies so it's going to be it's going to be a good news that's why i said in this pandemic india has a host of opportunities to explore and exploit wonderful uh, mr lapshya there are some students also in this uh, session listening to you would you like to advise these students how to develop a career in the export import industry yeah it's a very very exciting challenging uh, industry export and import where it's a wholesome it actually shapes up your attitude it makes you very mentally strong it makes you i mean your perseverance levels and tolerance tolerance levels also go up you become a very confident human being but uh, before jumping into any export import business you should do a course in exports and imports join as a trainee in um, one of the companies which is doing uh, either if you are interested in imports it should be a company which is into imports or export but ideally it should be both because both go hand in hand because most of the uh, companies we work for they are engaged in both because they import raw materials and export finished goods so work in such companies i have hands on experience for at least about 2 years it cannot happen overnight see don't take any shortcuts that uh, you know and then you have to strictly follow the laws and the rules do not circumvent or break the rules and the laws i am very clear i mean that principle you have in mind because the laws the rules of the exim trade are so stringent that if you break the rules and laws i mean your life is doomed then there is no way you can come back but if you follow the laws and the rules which are simple in the manner for those who follow them then i think it's a big ball game for you i mean there is nothing and there can not be a better business because it also gives you an opportunity to travel travel overseas travel mar- capture overseas markets have a look into the overseas products and what not get into contacts with various other products you can innovate you can there have been many exporters who have gone overseas found out what is the requirement and then as i told about value addition come back and done value addition to the same goods and then seen a boom in their business so exim trade is one trade which is very lucrative but yes always be honest diligent and do not circumvent any laws all right that's very inspirational and uh, as they always say at some stage all good things do come to a pause you've been very patiently answering all the questions and revealed so many facets of managing the trade despite all the difficult circumstances that one is going through thank you very much uh, mr lapsia on behalf of the entire team at the bombay management association it was indeed an honor listening to you and getting inspired with your thoughts and views may i request everybody to put on your videos so that we can capture this moment that we spent with mr lapsia getting a little more educated on this entire area of trade related to export import and i think the key takeaway was if one is able to add value with integrity then certainly any business and particularly the exim business is the right place to be at please give us about a couple of minutes so that our team from the bma secretariat will capture all of us who are here in a digital frame uh, we had about 75 people attending the session so we are spread over four screens and right now three screens some of them have opted out uh, before the photograph so please uh, give us that minute of digital patience lakshmi is doing the honors along with her colleagues oindrula and we are looking forward to this group photo your feedback and suggestions are welcome on what other topics we could organize for you while the photos are being taken i'm happy to share that the session on friday that we have friday funders this week is on very engaging learning activities when you deliver training on zoom because that is becoming the new normal those of us who have not yet registered can do the same you can get details from our website also next wednesday we have a very interesting session as you know we will be looking at various aspects in our wednesday wisdom webinar series next wednesday features dr kumar swami who is a leading dental surgeon and a cosmetic specialist who is going to talk about dental hygiene as the gateway to good health in conversation with another leading dentist 
Dr. Nishi Ganda Bajaj. This is our session next Wednesday for the webinar and Friday, I just mentioned to you. Do stay tuned so that we can keep you updated. Those of us who are not members of BMA, may I request you to join the BMA family and be part of this learning journey along with us. Keep smiling. I know sometimes it's difficult, but with four screens, you'll have to give us that moment till this entire process of capturing images is done. All done. All right, thank you very much, Lakshmi. Thank you especially to all our members and guests. Special mention of Indrapalji and Ernest Fernandez, our past presidents who have graced the occasion today. Thank you very much, Mr. Jant Lapsia. And we look forward to being in touch with you to learn as we go on. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.